<laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm. <laughs> I just want. I don't have an intro, so that's like the best I can do. Apologize. Apologize. I don't like love having music, but maybe I'll figure something out for an intro at some point. Something soothing, um, because I know some of you guys actually use this as like a a nighttime story. A nighttime story. I love nighttime stories. I usually listen to Joe Rogan. I love his voice. Food me right up bed. Um, but uh, how are you all doing? Welcome to a story time with X-Ray Girl. We are reading Dracula by Bram Stoker. We are on part three, um, however many chapters in, I'm not sure. We are on chapter six. It's Roman numerals, so that's six, right? Chapter six. So yeah, yeah. We got Trace here. Neil, hello, made butter. Uh, green chili butter popcorn. Ooh, that sounds good. A little spice. I love it. Hopefully his stream was good. Hello, James. Gary's here as well. A little darker. Librarian x-ray girl is the best x-ray girl. Is it really? I, 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 I'm actually shocked still how people are liking this uh, segment. So, I mean, this is fun for me. So I'm, I'm really happy. Really, really happy. Hi, Ricky. Love bedtime stories. You are very welcome. I'm glad you love it. Cool gamers here as well. Little bear. Hello. Um, so if this is your first time here, uh, we have part one and two uh, in a um, a list on my playlist. You can find that over there. What we're going to do is read for about an hour. Any super chats that are donations that come in during that time, I will uh, read it afterwards. That way it doesn't interrupt the flow. I still have, yet, oh my God, the puppies. I still have yet to um, take the previous readings and put them into their own separate, just cut the beginning and the end, put them together into a very um, non-professional <laughs> audio book so you can actually listen to it straight through. So that's the plan at least. Um, I'll do it at some point, at some point. Hi, the Zach. Hello, Deranged Lunatic. But yeah. Uh, once I get started well you know oh we got discount dracula in the chat look we got well you're probably not that discount this one's really old he uh he's withering away withering away um i do want to just grab oh my god i thought i had another bookmark on the shelf on my table here i do not oh i'm just gonna use this receipt for now it's a really thick receipt Okay, it's gonna make the first chapter a little awkward. That's okay. Hi, Holocron. I just know how I don't have to cut anything. Could do a playlist with timestamps. Oh well, no, I just want to cut the beginning and the end because I don't want to have these super chats in. Also, I need Mark to like calm down the dogs. I don't want the barking to happen while I'm reading. Canadian Zeus, hello, hail all, love story time. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoy it. Story time for my coding session. <gasps> I hope I don't put you to sleep. <laughs> All my stories are old stories, luckily enough. That way I don't get in trouble. Hello, Brian. What's up? I love that you're doing this peace sign. <sighs> Appropriating Asian culture. I approve of it. I approve of it. You know, the next thing you can do for that would be the... That's a heart. It's a heart. But anyways... So uh, I'm going to get started in just a moment and then we'll go for about an hour till about 10 ish. And then uh, unless the story is really good, I might continue reading if it's really, 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 really good. OK, uh, so chapter six, Mina Murray's journal, 24 July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station looking sweeter and lovelier than ever. And we drove up to the house at the crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbor. The great viaduct runs across with high piers, though which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the highland on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed and seemed pile up one over the other. Anyhow. Oh my God. Okay. One second. I'm going to reread that. I'm just, I, I need to, I'm going to be right back. I don't like doing this. I just, I don't want the dogs barking in all this audio. One second.
This is the solution. We've brought him over here for story time. You need to calm down, my little child. And, uh... Give you a sweater. I apologize for the interruption. Lucy is a strumpet. <laughs> All right, Rocky's a little strumpet. He's naked. Hitler reacts to x-ray dogs. <laughs> what? You heard no dogs, really? Who's barking so loud? You need to calm down and go take a nap. Think you can nap? Vampire dog? Uh, she doesn't eat raw meat. So no. No. I'm going to reread all of that. Okay. Baby boy. Come on. Full-time dog mother over here. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, John. Okay. Chapter 6, Mina Murray's Journal. 24 July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbor. The great viaduct runs across with high piers, though which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed and seem piled up one over the other, anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes and which is the scene of the part of Marmium, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin and of, of immense size and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town, there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbor and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbor that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them, though the churchyard and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my new book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. It seemed to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbor lies below me with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea with a curve outwards at the end of it in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the seawall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end two has a high, uh, two has a lighthouse. Between the two piers, there is a narrow opening into the harbor, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high tide, but when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there's merely the stream of the Esk running between the banks of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbor on this side there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a boy with a bell, which swings in a bad weather and sends a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very skeptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at the sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said very brusquely, I wouldn't fash muscle about them, miss. Them things be all wore out, mind. I don't say that they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my, my time. 
They'd be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for the nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet would creed out. I wonder, Maisel, who'd be bothered telling lies to them, even the newspaper, which is full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin the clock struck six, whereupon he labored to get up and said, I must gain again a words. Home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to cramble up boon the grease, for there be a many of them, and miss, I lack belly timber, sarely by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature of the place. I led from, they led from the town up to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many, but they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother, and as they won't, were only duty calls, I did not go. There will be home, they will be home by this time. 25 July. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk about my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful color since she has been here. I noticed that the old man did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fall in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock, and barrel. That's what it be. And now, and not else. These bands and wafts and bogosts and barguests uh, and bogles and all and net them is only fit to set barons and dizzy women all baltering. <laughs> they be not but all air blubs. They and all grims and signs of warnings. Be all invented by parsons and ilsum spook bodies and railway tutors and skiers and scunner halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to. It makes me powerful to think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printing lies on paper and preaching them out all pulpits. Does not want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here all around, you and what er ye will, all them steens holding up their heads as well as they can out of their pride. Is the camp simply tumbling down with the weight over their lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them, and yet in nigh half of them, there bent no bodies at all, and the memories of them bent care to pinch and snuff about, much less scared, lies all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, but it'll be a queer scouterment at the day of judgment when they come tumbling up here in their death sarks, all juped together and trying to drag their tombstones down with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trembling and dithering with their hands that doesn't and slippery from lying in the sea that they can't keep their group over them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Seriously, these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins! They may be a poorish few, not wrong, save in where they make out the people too good. For there be folks that do think a bomb bowl like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. 
Now look, you hear. You come here, a stranger, and you see this Kirk Garth. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on. And you consait with those, all those steens, be a boon folk, that be happed here, snod and snog. I assented again. Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay beds that be tombs and old duns back a box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions and they all laughed. And my gog, how could they be otherwise? Look at that one. The aftest abaft the beer bank read it and went over and read. Edward Spenclag, master mariner murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April 1854. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to have him here? Murdered off the coast of the Andres, and you consated his body all lay under. Why, I could have named ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above. He pointed northwards. Or where the currents may have drifted drift them, there be the steens around ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. These Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in 20, or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas of 1777, or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later, or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in 50. Do ye think that all these men will have come to make a rush to Whitby than the trumpet sounds? I have me anthrums aboot it. I tell ye that when they got here, they be jomlin' and jostlin' one another that way. It it would have been like a fight up on the ice in the old days when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark and trying them to tie our cuts by the light of the aurora borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, Surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all poor people or their spirits will have to take their tombstone from them on the day of judgment. Do you think that it will be really necessary? Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose? This he said with intense scorn. How will it pleasure these relatives to know that lies is wrote about them and that everybody in this place knows that they be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet which had been laid down as a slab on which the seat was rested. Close to the edge of the cliff read the lines on that rough steen, he said. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leaned over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of the glorious resurrection on July 29th, 1873, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb is erected by his soaring mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't ought... You don't see aught funny? Ha <laughs> ha, but that's because you don't gone the soaring mother was a hail cat that hated him because he was a croup. A regular lamenter he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that they had for scaring the crows with. Torn from the crows then, for it brought the clegs and the doubts to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of the glorious resurrection, it's I'm often heard him say, Maisel, that he hoped he'd go to hell for his mother was so pious that she's sure to go to heaven and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now, isn't that the steen at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack of lies and won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes panting up the grease with the tomb steen balanced on his hump and asks it to be told as evidence. I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up. Oh, why did you tell us of this? It is my favorite seat and I cannot leave it. And now I must 
go and sit over on the grave of a suicide. It won't harm ye, my pretty, and it may make poor old Jordy gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, I sat here off and on for nigh 20 years past, and it hadn't done me no harm. Don't ye fash about them as lies under ye, or that doesn't lie on them either. It'll be time for ye to be getting scart when ye see the tomb scenes all run away, and the place so bare on as a stubble field. There's the clock, and I must gang my, my service to ye ladies. And off ye hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we, as we sat. She told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. It made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town. Sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly, they run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleeding in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of a donkey's hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the piers is playing the harsh waltz in a good time, and further along the quay, there is a Salvation Army meeting in a, in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he was here. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5 June. The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He was certain, he has certain qualities very largely developed selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know yet. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into a fury as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them all away. Of course, I said. That would do. I must watch him. 18 June. He has turned his mind now to spiders has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside in his room. 1st July. His spiders are now becoming a great nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while, much while with him when, for when a horrid blowfly bloated with some carrion food buzzed into the room. He caught it, held it, exulting it a few moments between his fingers and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he rids of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting something down. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers, adding up to up in batches, and the totals adding up in batches again, as though he was focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8 July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon. And then, oh unconscious celebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. 
He has managed to get a sparrow and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming it is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19 July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice little sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity, and I did not care for his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present. I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see to it. His face fell and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look that meant killing. The man is an underdeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with this present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended on it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it. Whereupon he went without a word and sat down, gnawing on his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning early. 20 July. Visited Renfield very early before the attendant spent his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved in the window and has manifestedly beginning his fly catching again and beginning it cheerfully and with good grace. I looked around for his birds and did not see them. Asked him where they were. He replied without turning round that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room and on his pillow, a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there were anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant was just about to tell me uh, Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagus, life-eating maniac. That he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect? The knowledge of the brain, had I even the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden, Sanderson, psychology, or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause, I must not think too much of this or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, or may not I too be of an exceptional brain congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. 
I wonder at how many lives he values a man or if at one, but only one. He has closed the account most accurately and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours, but I must only wait on hopeless and work. Work, work. If I only could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's journal, 26 July. I am anxious and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there's also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I have not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who was always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking if he had heard, and he had said the enclosed had just been received. It was only a line dated from Castle Dracula and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me very uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has taken lately to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of every room every night. Mrs. Westerna had an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs and then get suddenly wakened up and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear, she is naturally anxious about Lucy. She tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn and she is already planning out her dress and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize for her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Homewood, he is the Honorable Arthur Homewood, only son of the Lord God Damning, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. He wants to take him, she wants to take him to the seat of the churchyard cliff and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27 July. No news from Jonathan. I'm getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should not, I do not know. But I do wish that he would write. If it were a single line, Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I'm awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold. But still, the anxiety and the perpetually being wakened is beginning to tell on me, and I'm getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Homewood has been suddenly called to the ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3 August, another week gone. No news from Jonathan. Not even to Mr. Hawkins, for whom I have heard. But I do hope he is not ill. I surely would have written. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his and somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him and yet it is in his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has had not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her, which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door and finding it locked, goes about the room, searching for the key. 3 August, another week gone and no news from Jonathan, not even to Miss. Oh, I read that. 6 August, another three days and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier, but no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. 
Today is a gray day, and the sun, as I write, is hidden in the thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is gray except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Gray earthy rock, gray clouds, tinged with the sunburst in the far edge, hang over the gray seas in which the sand points stretch like gray fingers. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar muffled in the sea mist, drifting inland. The horizons is lost in gray mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist and seem men like walking trees. These fishing boats are racing for home and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbor, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk to me. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully as he said, leaving his hand in mine. I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and such alike for past weeks, but I didn't mean them. And I want you to remember that when I'm gone, we of folks that be daffled and with one foot abaft with crock hole don't altogether like to think of it, but we don't want to feel scared of it. And that's why I took to making light of it, <laughs> change an accent again, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit but lord love ye miss i ain't afraid of dying not a bit only i don't want to die if i can help it my time must be nigh at hand now for i be old and hundred years is m too much for any man to expect and i'm so nigh that it's the old man is already wet in his scythe you see I can't get out of the habit of caffing about it all at once the chaps will wag as they used to be they used to. Someday soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me, but don't you jewel and greet Madiri. For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse the call. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something than else than what we're doing. And death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's coming for me, Madiri. And coming quick. And maybe coming while we be looking and wondering, maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the host beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. Lord, make me answer cheerily when my call comes. He held me in his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes, silence. He got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said goodbye, and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with the spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at the strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the way of her. But she's knocking out in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north to the open or to put it out there. Look there again. She is steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel and changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more about her this time tomorrow. Chapter 7 Let me have a drink first. Chapter 7. Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8 August. Pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent, Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been something sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine and as was ever known and the great body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Mig 
rig mill, Runswick, Staiths, and various trips in the neighborhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard and from that commanding eminence watched the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mares and tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which in barometr barometric language ranked number two light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report and one old fisherman who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the East Cliff foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so beautiful so grand in its masses of splendidly colored clouds that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped down below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset color, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all tints of gold, with here and there masses not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness in all sorts and shapes as well outlined as colossal silhouettes the experience was not lost on the painters and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the ra and ri walls in may next more than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble or his mule as they term the different classes of boats would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed the wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, at the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. They, there were but few lights in the sight of sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually hugged the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for a comet whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before 10 o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive and the silence was so marked that the bleeding of a sheep inland or the barking of the dog in the town was distinctly heard and the band on the pier with its lively French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. The little like uh, a little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea and high overhead the air began to carry a strange faint hollowing boom. Then, without warning, a tempest broke with a rapidity which at the time seemed incredible and even afterward is impossible to realize. The whole aspect of nature at once began convulsed. The waves rose in fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. The White crested waves beat madly at the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers and with their spume swept the lanthorns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbor. The wind roared like thunder and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet or clung with grim grasp in the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have been increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds, which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of all those lost at sea were touching them living brethren, brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreaths of the sea mist swept by. At times the mist clears, 
and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast, followed by such peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were an immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea running mountains high through skyward with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into spaces. Here and there, a fishing boat with a rag of sail running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again, the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east coast, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it to working order. In the pauses of the inrushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective as when a fishing boat with gunwale underwater rushed into the harbor, able by the guidance of the sheltering light to avoid the danger of dashing against the pier. As each boat as each boat as each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore. A shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was then swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time back to the east, and there was a shudder amongst, amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have had time to time suffered. And with the great wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbor. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their, trough, in their troughs, the shallows of the shore were almost visible. And the schooner with all sails set was rushing with such speed that in the words of one old salt, she must fetch up somewhere if it were only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog greater than any hitherto, a mass of dank mist, which seemed to, to close on all things like a great pall and left available to men only the organ of hearing for the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder and booming of the mighty billows came through the dark oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbor mouth across the east pier where the shock was expected and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted into the blast, and then Mirabel Dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before this blast, with all sail set, and gained the safety of the harbor. The searchlight followed her, and suddenly ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was the corpse, with drooping head which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by miracle, had found the harbor, unsteered save by the hand of the dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms in the southeast corner of the pier jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sandy heap. Each, every spar, rope, and stay was strained by some of the top hammer and came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below as if shot up by the concussion and ran forward, jumped from the bow on the sand, making straight for the steep cliff where the churchyard hangs over the laneway in the east pier so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, the rough steens, or the roof stones, as they call them in the Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff had fallen its disappearance into the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses in proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. 
Thus, the Coast Guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb on board. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The Coast Guard ran aft, and then he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It was a good way round from the west cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier. But your correspondent is a fairly good runner and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, whom the Coast Guard and the police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck and was one of the small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to the spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the hood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro, and so that the cords which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, surgeon J.M. Caffeine of 33, East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making examination that the man has to have been dead quite for two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied his own hands, fastening the knot with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on in the admiralty of court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. However, the legal tongues are wagging and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in the contravention of the statutes of Mortman, since the tiller, as emblemship, is not proof or delegated possession, is held in the dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honorable watch and ward till death. A steadfastness as noble as that the young Casabianca and placed in the mortuary to wait inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing and its fierceness is abating. The crowds are scattering homeward and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire words. I shall send in time for your next issue. A further details of the derelict ship which I found her way so miraculously into the harbor in the storm. Whitby, 9 August. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast the silver sand with only a small amount of cargo, the number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington of Seven the Crescent who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of the Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulation, as the matter is to be a nine days wonder. They are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of after complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened or made its way on to the moors, where it was still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such possibility, lest later on it should be in itself becoming a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. 
Early this morning, a large dog, a half-breed mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite to its master's yard. It had been fighting and manifestedly had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away and its belly was slit open as if with a savage claw. Later. By the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I had been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest except as to facts of missing men. The greater interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest. In a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold, it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting the technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he got well into blue water and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken. Come grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul who kindly translated for me time being short. Log of Demeter, Varna to Whitby, written 18 July. Things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate notes henceforth till we land. On 6 July, we finished taking in cargo of silver sand in the boxes of earth. At noon set sail, east wind fresh, crew five hands, two mates, cook and myself, captain. On 11 July at dawn, entered Bosphorus, Boarded by Turkish customs officer, Bakshish, all correct, underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Dardanelles, more custom officers, and flagboat of guarding squadron, Bakshish again, work of the officers thorough but quick, want us off soon. At dark passed into archipelago, archipelago. On 13 July, passed Cape Matapan, crew dissatisfied about something, seemed scared, but would not speak out. On 14 July, there was something anxious about the crew, men all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took Larbard, watched eight balls last night, was relieved by Abramov, but did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever all said they expect something of the kind, but would not say more than that there was something aboard. Mate getting imp impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. 17 July. Yesterday, one of the men, Algorin, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that there... Uh, that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man who was not like any of the crew come up to the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bow, found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search entire ship carefully from stem to stern later in the day i got together the whole crew and told them as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship and we would search from stem to stern first mate angry said it was a folly and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a handspike and let him take the helm while the rest began thorough search all keeping abreast with lanterns we left no corner unsearched as there were only the big wooden boxes there was no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search was over and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather lasts three days and all hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten about their dread. Mate cheerful again and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over the ship, already a shorthand and entering the bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. 
men all in a panic of fear, sent a round robin asking to have double watch as they fear to be alone, mate violent, fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men will do some violence. 28 July, four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom and the wind of a tempest, no sleep for anyone, men all worn out, hardly know how to set a watch since no one fit to go on, second mate volunteered to steer and watch and let men snatch a few hours of sleep, wind abating, sea still terrific, but feel them less as ship is steadier. 21, 29 July, another tragedy, had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double, when morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without a second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth and wait for a sign of cause. 30 July, last night. We rejoiced we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly, awaked by crew telling me that both men on watch and steersmen missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work. 1 August. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails and have to run before the wind. Dare not lower or could not rise them again. We seem to be drifting in some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of the men. His strong nature seems to have worked inwardly against him. Men are beyond fear, working stol stolidly and patiently with minds made up to worst. They are Russians, he Romanian. 2 August midnight. Woke up for a few minutes asleep by hearing a cry. Seemingly outside my port, could not see anything in the fog, rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says he must be past Straits of Dover as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland. Just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are off now to the North Sea and only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, but when I got to it, found no one there. The wind was steady as we ran before it there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds, he rushed up on deck with, in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reasons was, has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night, I saw it like a man, tall and thin and ghostly pale, it was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air, and as he spoke, he took his knife and drove it savagely into the space. Then he went on, but it was here, and it'll find it, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of the boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm with a warning look and his finger on his lip. He went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern, and go down the forward hatchway. He is a mad, stark, raving mad, and it is no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They were invoiced as clay, and to put them about it is as harmless as though he can be. So here I stay, and mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God, and wait till the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down the sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly all over now, just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him. There came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream which made my blood run cold, and up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me, save me, he cried, and then looked round at the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You'd better come too, Captain, before it's too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang up on the bull rack and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now, 
It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, will that ever be? 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I am a sailor. Why else? I know not. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed in the dimness of the night. I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It is better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water. No man can object, but I am captain and I must not leave my ship. I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch, and then come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as a captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not well, then all men shall know that I have been true to my truest. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk hold almost universally that the captain is a, is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken to the train of boats up to the Esk for a piece, and then brought back down to Tate Hill Pier, and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard of the cliff. The owners of the more than a hundred boats have been given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog at which there is much mourning for with public opinion in its present state he would i believe be adopted by the town tomorrow we'll see the funeral and so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea nina murray's journal 8 august lucy was very restless at night and i too could not sleep the storm was fearful as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came up, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her to bed. It is a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there, and if there be any, disappears she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning, we both got up and went down to the harbor to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clean and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbor, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow, I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night, but on land. But oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he and how? I'm getting fearfully anxious about him. If only I knew what to do and could do anything. 10 August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbor seemed to be there and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hale Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me. And we went early to our old seat whilst the cortege of the boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time. I cannot think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, but if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the man said made him shudder. Poor dear old man. 
Perhaps he had seen death in his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acute, acutely than others, other people do. Just now, she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog was always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently and then, harshly and then, angrily, but it would neither come nor cease to make noise. It was in a sort of fury with his eyes savage, and all its hairs bristling up like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Finally, the man, too, got angry and jumped down and kicked the dog and then took it by the scruff of his neck and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell all into a tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect, to, take, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity, too. But she did not attempt to touch the dog and looked at it in an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is too super sensitive and nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I'm sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into a port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, and now furious and now in terror will all afford material for her dreams. I think it will be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have too much inclination for sleepwalking then. Two chapters. That was a... I was actually getting a little bored. I'm not going to lie. I was getting a little bored. And then all of a sudden, that ship diary. Whoo! Oh my God. Also, my accent, horrible. Absolutely horrible. I'm so sorry for butchering whatever accent that was. I don't even know. Ugh. I was thirsty. Puppy. Okay. Oh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully you enjoyed that. The ship was an intense part of the story. Oh my God. I was not expecting that. Did Dracula get on the ship? We still have Jonathan. We don't know what happened to him. There's so much happening right now. Dracula. I think that was Dracula. It has to be, right? Right? Who else could have killed those people? The quality of your reading is improving as you go. Yes. I'm I'm hoping. I know that with the old language, though, that's the only thing. Like, because I'm not used to talking like that. It, um... Like there's some things the way it's phrased that I can't um it doesn't come naturally, but it is getting better. It is getting better. So yeah. Jackie. Tired. Are you tired, baby boy? Oh, he's tired. He was like biting my finger earlier. Poor guy. He's like a baby. He wants to like bite on things and suckle on my finger. <laughs> Oh, you are very welcome, little bear. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, sorry I didn't catch up on the chat. Was there anything exciting that happened? Um, people talked about the weather. Is this the x-ray exotic reading? No, there was no... Uh, the I think part two had a little something. Or was it part one? I think part one had a little something, something sexy in it, but it didn't turn out sexy. So, uh, wow. I'm just, I'm just looking at chat. <laughs> I can't believe I did like a really horrible accent. That accent was so bad. And also, I, I, I just want to know what happened to Jonathan. You know, I, I really want to know what happened to Jonathan. Jonathan Harker, if you were there for the beginning, he went to Dracula's castle um, doing a business, I guess. Doing business. And uh, he got trapped there. And he had to send three letters home saying that he was going home. And we don't know. We have no clue. Well, I have no clue. You might know. Yeah. 
The writing is good. Watch Hammer Vampire movies. Wow. Vampire bimbos. Well, they were talking about vampire bimbos. Vampire bimbos. So, yeah. Jonathan likes turtles. Sounds like Steph. Steph likes turtles. He becomes the one. I don't know if I should believe that. I don't know if I should believe it. Ooh, they'll elaborate later on Jonathan. I know. I snuck a, a peek at the... So, I always... With these books, they have the chapters at the beginning. So, I did see... We have, like... So, we're on chapter 8 now. So, we're going to go to Mina Murray's journal. And then letters from Mina Harker to Lucy Wisterna. Dr. Seward's uh, letter. And then we're Lucy Wisterna's diary. Seward's diary... And then we get to the end here in chapter uh, 19, Jonathan Harker's journal. So we do go back to him, which I'm kind of excited about. Oh, it was the last one. The last one was spicy. There was there was a moment. Yeah, booming Bob. I, I don't know if anyone put in the comments when it was, but it uh, got a little dotsy. Got a little dotsy. Uh, hey, X-Ray, we should start a band. We'll call it books. That way no one can judge us but our... <laughs> I love that dad joke. Thank you. Thank you for me, love. Most movie adaptations are fairly faithful. I'm hoping that these were faithful. I just, um, you know, I feel like the quality of writing compared to today's writing, it is vastly different. But also, I'm also looking at one of the more cl classic popular books. And you also don't know the copy books, but I don't know. You don't get something like this today. Absolutely do not get something like this today. Um, if, if someone does, I, I guess Tolkien is like the closest uh, I can think of in terms of age. I don't know if anyone has a better writer in mind. If you do, you know, let me know. Dracula, Dead and Loving, it is Mel Brooks' adaptation of Dracula. Can you do ASMR? I don't know. How much are binaural uh, microphones? Let's see. Uh, all right. We have... I don't know where to buy binaural headphones or not headphones <laughs> microphones oh my god okay so the first one that i see here is uh nine hundred dollars wow that is expensive vampire asmr i would i would consider it if we did like a because I I'm pretty set for my gear. I've bought my all my all my own gear. Maybe do like a donation, hit certain thing. Maybe that would be better. I don't know. I just I, I cannot. I don't want to drop nine hundred dollars on a microphone. Whew, those are expensive. Expensive. But that's just like the one I see on Amazon. Uh. ASMR microphone. Mm -mm -mm. Yeti comes up. <laughs> Blue Yeti. These are definitely not a, I don't know. S microphones for ASMR. Let's see what comes up. 10 best ASMR mics. We have, wow, apparently a Blue Yeti is good for ASMR. I don't think this is for real. This list seems stupid. I don't know. What do what do people use for ASMR? I don't know. I don't know. This is my first time looking into it, so. Uh hello. Do you know what Friday nights at Freddy's? Is. No, I don't. Want to let me know? I have two phones plating you in stereo. I don't know what that means either. Oh, 
playing you. <laughs> I was thinking like plating me like a dinner. <laughs> ASMR Zeitgeist has varying kinds of binaural microphones. Might be a good place to look. Zeitgeist? Zeitgeist? That's a person? Does he have a store? I'm just looking at pictures of him. So there's some binaural ones, and then there are uh, regular microphones. Binaural ones probably are pretty expensive because you have to have two separate microphones. It's an investment. Um, I've never been into the idea of ASMR. I think if people are interested in it, uh, that has to come from the audience interest. I don't know if I could invest in something that I'm not personally interested in. Can't think of any author, author offhand. GRM Game of Thrones is great, but we all know he'll never finish. <laughs> He's not a 38 second man. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not being cheap. It's not being cheap. It's called being interested and in making good financial decisions. I'm part of my channel. <sighs> yeah, when well, $900 is like out of no interest. Like I bought microphones because I was interested in like doing this sort of stuff. And obviously it's worked out, but. Nine hundred dollars or something that I not, eh, you know, reading aloud is what people did for fun in the eighteen hundreds. Those books are meant to be out read out loud, unlike today's books. Well, I will say, like you saw that I got shocked midway through because this is my first time reading it. Like that, a lot of the stuff is so captivating. I don't get like this reading other books, maybe Harry Potter books back in the day. I remember like being shocked about what happened in them. Yeah. It's like a mannequin head with my kin ears. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them like binaural stuff. Like I'll show you even um uh binaural headphones. Yeah. Or not headphones. What am I talking about? Microphones. Yeah. If someone really, really, really wants me to do uh ASMR and wants to invest in my channel, <laughs> I will gladly do content like that uh here we go some of them actually are like a head too which is kind of kind of funny like these ones this one this is the one i saw nine hundred dollars it's crazy nine hundred dollars absolutely insane i am in canada hi happy Weirdest horror game ever. Matt Pat and made a cure right there. Oh, it's a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lovecraft. I know people have told me Lovecraft, so I'm gonna go through all the books that I have currently right now. I have my Penguin Classics. I did a course on villains. This one I did buy from the um, the thrift store. It was two dollars. Two dollars and fifty cents. Great, great find. Great find. <sighs> Oh, it's a horror game, kind of like Faz, like you're running away from creepy guy. Oh, it's like what I do on a daily when I was younger. Not anymore. No one's running after me these days. <laughs> you check out check out the book Camilla. It's a vampire story that predates Dracula by 26 years. Oh, Gerald, uh, Camilla, book vampire. I okay, I just saw it just now. Oh, Sheridan Le Fanu. Ooh. Oh my god, the cover is like really creepy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save this. I have a bunch of books bookmarked right now. Bookmark. Uh, where is the books tab? <laughs> oh, here it is. Bookmark this tab. Oops. One second. Done. There we go. Bookmarked. I got it. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, you missed it. Sorry. I have to go back. I'm in Canada, Toronto area. Uh oh, is this a microphone? Neil. Um, one second. Let me see how expensive this is. Oh. 
This is interesting. So it's like an isolation shield, which helps with doing ASMR. Is, is that what it's supposed to do? I don't know. I'll look into it. I'll, I'll keep it up the window. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Zeitgeist uses a tiny one, but I have no idea how much it is. He edits faces onto them. If you look at his thumbnails, I, I did see that. I did see that. Hi, Happy. Hi, Christian. My girlfriend and I were watching a vampire movie. She asked who my favorite vampire was. I said, the one from Sesame Street. She said, he doesn't count. I said, I assure you, he does. <laughs> He's technically a vampire. Uh, nice. Thank you. Question, is the address you have listed on YouTube about page still good? Oh, brother, what are you going to do? Yes, it technically is. Yeah. Let me just make sure. You're having me worried now. I usually go to... Um, I usually go to... Yeah, that one's good. I'll, it's all... It's most of my description as well. So those addresses is good. Make sure you're very specific about that. Um, that's... Uh, it's correct. The Bradford, Ontario one. He does count. He does count. My favorite... Chat, who's your favorite vampire? Um, Edward Cullen. <laughs> oh, no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My favorite vampire... Blade? I think he's pretty cool. I know he's only half a vampire, but I think he's pretty cool. Seems like a nice person in general. Might be a little gruff, but I think I'd rather... You stab me in my front than my back. Good for recording. Get soundboard adjust levels. Ooh. Maybe I'll look into it. Maybe I'll look into it. Hail to Majinai. Hail chat. Hashtag pimp raid. <gasps> Who's a pimp? Are you a pimp? Are you raiding me? I don't know. Who's pimp? I don't know a person named pimp. My favorite vampire is Barnabas Collins from the original Dark Shadows TV show. <gasps> Spike from Buffy. Also good. Cool. Spike. Best. Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. Into I haven't watched that. I should watch that. Dracula. I'm ki I was kidding about Edward Cullen, okay? Unforeseen Elder. I'm basic. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm pretty basic too. Lestat. Ooh, I liked Aaliyah in um, Queen of the Damned, but I thought she was like cool and whatnot. I was young back then, okay? <laughs> I hadn't seen many vampire movies at that point. Maybe I'll have it in the books. I think Mark is still on EFAP right now. Is EFAP still going on? Ooh. Yamaha, check pawn shops in Vegas, also for mics. Ooh, maybe. You're the pimp we're reading. <laughs> Dimagini. Oh my God, who are you pimping out? The only things I'm pimping you is my puppy. Poor boy is so sleepy right now. Are you sleepy? He's so sleepy. Oh my god, I haven't seen him this tired since, well, last night. Classic Nosferatu. Never heard of that. I like saying that, Nosferatu. Don't know if I'm saying it right. My sister is a vampire. Uh, let me ask you. If you, do, if you go down on your girl... She's bleeding. Does that make you a vampire? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, don't answer that. Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing Hammer Films. Ooh. Asking because I started just... Because I just started a soap company was going to send freebies and maybe copyright free book. <gasps> that would be amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, the only... No. I have no allergies with soaps. We're good. Sorry, I had to think about that. <laughs> There's uh, certain things I, can, I can't eat and then certain things I can't use on my face. With like my body, it's usually fine. I don't think I've had an allergy to soap on my body yet. I don't have to use it on my face. I think it should be good. That's exciting though. I thought Marius from Queen the Dam was the best vampire in the movie. Oh, I don't even remember who that was. I'm a pimp named Imagini. <laughs> Love it. And Osferatu is a silent film. Very creepy. Oh, I've never seen that. I have to add that to a list. To the list. All right, guys. Um, I am. Uh, I probably should go to bed soon. I have had a long day streaming. And tomorrow, it's going to be another long day. And I have a 
night shift tomorrow. So I'm going to try to sleep all morning. Probably not going to happen. And what's going to happen likely is I'm going to just stay up all day tomorrow into the all night tomorrow and then wake up uh, or sorry, go to bed at after 24 hours. My favorite horror movie on. Um, hmm. So I love Cabin in the Woods because it's a great twist on a scary movie that is funny and scary. Um, kind of parody scary, but it's still scary. And then we, I, I, I really, really, I don't know why, but I love Resident Evil. Love Resident Evil. It's a great scary movie. I haven't watched Silent Hill, so who knows? Maybe that one will beat it. I don't know. I had to watch Resident Evil like a hundred times just to not be scared of it when I was a kid. It's crazy. Yeah, you're welcome. As long as people enjoy them, that's what that's what matters. I'm glad you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, hopefully you keep enjoying them. I have to rest my voice now. <laughs> the best one, I mean, I was entertained by the thing, but I wouldn't say it's the best one. It's pretty good. Everyone goes to night shift as an EMS. He never sleeps. He can never nail his sleep schedule well. Next week is a bad week for me. I think I have four night shifts. So we'll see how, how bad that goes. But yeah, uh, tomorrow we have Sunday Fun Day, 3 p.m. We're going to do um, Sons of the Forest with uh, Garrett as Jane Theory. I think Shagsworth and maybe Tugs. And then we have Forbidden Frontier at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to stream Hogwarts Legacy. It depends on how I feel. Probably will, to be honest. Just stream till like 12, take a nap, Sons of the Forest, and then FF. But yeah. All right. I'm going to say bye. Bye. Baby boy, you have to say bye to the chat. Say bye. <laughs> He's so poor thing thing. I'll see you guys later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.